Okay, good morning and uh, welcome to this class. We'll continue with um, our session here on the book of Hebrews. All right, uh, so let's uh, pray and uh, we will pick up from where we stopped. I want to request someone who has not prayed so far on this class to kindly unmute and pray. That would be good. All right. Uh, any volunteers? Okay, it's all right if you've prayed on this class before, but yeah, anyone can please pray. Ma'am, shall I pray? Yes, sister, please do. Father God, we thank you this morning. Father, thank you for settling the issue and giving us this access to the class, Lord. Please bless us as we gather in your presence this morning. Fill us anew, afresh. Open our hearts and minds to receive your word, Lord God. Father God, Father, quicken our hearts to be in line, in tune with your word. And Father, give us the grace to imbibe whatever truths you have to teaching us, O oh Lord God. Father, let them become life and flesh in us that they may flow through us in the name of Jesus. Thank you for our ma'am, Nancy. Bless each one of us, empower us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. Thank you so much for leading in prayer. Um, we have been talking about entering God's rest, and we saw how faith and patience are uh, so important for us to enter the promises of God. We've understood the several aspects about the God kind of rest which is uh, available for every believer and it is really uh, an initiative on the part of each believer to enter that rest. Uh, that's why the term enter there because uh, that's something that each one of us needs to do on our uh, or rather uh, have that initiative to enter into the kind of rest that God is offering us. So we talked a lot about that. And um, right after that, you know, we uh, began reading Hebrews chapter 4. We saw there that uh, again, the uh, writer goes on to reiterating some of those same things about entering the rest and, um, uh, you know, to respond to the promptings of the Lord. He uses this term called as today. Uh, where he says that if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart, but respond to him immediately, which is what God really expects of us. Uh, here in verse 8, so I'm going to uh, start off from verse 8 of chapter 4, uh, where the scripture says, For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, verse 9, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So we also uh, talked about the fact that God is uh, omnipotent and uh, therefore he is not someone who requires rest. But the concept of God's rest has to do more with him finishing what he had intended to do. So he finished his work and thereby he rested. Uh, and he offers us a rest which is greater than the rest that people experienced when they entered into the promised land. Because uh, in this context, he is talking about rest. He began talking about rest as if to enter into the promises of God, enter into the promised land. So he makes a reference here in verse 8 to Joshua, where he says, if Joshua had given them rest. Now, Joshua and Caleb were those two people who went into the promised land and uh, they led the conquest of the promised land part by part. Now, one more beautiful thing about the mention of Joshua is the fact that the uh, 
name Joshua, you know, it it uh, it is sort of um, uh, similar to the name of Jesus, like in terms of its, uh, you know, the meaning and it, it means salvation. So he's saying that the human salvation or the things that mankind has to offer for for us to enter into rest uh, it's not been enough for us which is why god sent the lord jesus for us to complete that uh, work for us so that actual rest has come to us through jesus so that word joshua is significant because it uh, talks about salvation Okay, but our ultimate salvation is from the Lord Jesus Christ. So then again in verse 11, he says something like, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. There is this term called diligent. We said so far that for us to enter into God's rest, one very important thing is faith. But here he adds the term diligent. So we can uh, we can recognize there is also this concept of diligent faith. Diligence is uh, being earnest. Diligent is, um, you know, sort of uh, making up your mind about something and working on it without you know, letting it go. So that's the simple understanding of this term diligence. Now, when he says diligent faith, what he means is a consistent faith, a consistent faith which does not move away no matter how things are and how circumstances are and how life situations are. So uh, we've been saying that the listeners uh, were in, in a phase of their lives where they were discouraged to the point that they could have even given up their faith. And which is why he's saying that we need to hold on to faith. We need to continue in faith and not just, you know, faith that may come in uh, 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 just some rushes or sort of, uh, you know, some spurts, but faith which is consistent, faith which is earnest faith which is diligent so hold on to your faith and don't compromise it so let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest that simply means have the kind of uh, diligent faith okay which is required and if one does not have diligent faith what are what is the risk that they run they too can fall Okay, similar to the disobedience uh, of the Israelites. Now, he goes ahead and he talks about the power of God's word. So let's read this. Uh, I would like to request someone to please read verses 12 and 13. Chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the divisions of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Sorry, everyone. Uh, okay, we have a pointer towards the powerful word of God here in verse 12. Uh, it's an oft-repeated scripture, so I'm sure we all already understand it uh, quite well. Sorry. But we'll try to see um, what are all the different aspects about the word of God that are spoken uh, in, in this particular verse, verse 12. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful so when he says that the word of god is living we understand that the word of god is alive it is uh, in other words not a dormant entity that the word of god has life in it okay uh, so the way we can recognize you know what uh, the ability of the word is that the word can 
uh, speak back to us accurately. Uh, I am sure this has been the experience of all of us as we read God's word. It's not that you know we are we are the ones who are only trying to engage with the word, but on the from the other side, we feel like the word is engaging with us. You know, in our own situation, and that's the beauty of God's word. It's not dormant, it's not inert, but it is alive. And the word of God speaks to us. The word of God also answers us when we um, read it prayerfully. We can almost, you know, uh, hear. Uh, in the sense that, okay, sometimes I know that we may not get those direct answers, but God is leading us in a certain path and transforming us from within and the word of God engages with us. So the word of God really helps us meet with God. It's beyond a set of information, but the word of God helps us, uh, you know, encounter God in a powerful way. So the next thing there is that the word of God is powerful. So the word being alive and the word uh, engaging with us, speaking to us, that is understood. Now, when we say that the word is powerful, it has uh, the ability to do wonders. In our lives, one of the greatest struggles of mankind is to experience change from within, lasting change, uh, or uh, we can use the term transformation of the uh, the heart of, of a person, the the mind of a person. But God's word promises us in uh, Romans twelve verse two. It says, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, that is something that uh, the world cannot offer us in entirety. Yes, we can see some, uh, you know, some changes here and there because of information uh, that is available in the world. But God's word promises us transformation through the renewing of our mind. Renewing of our, our mind has to do with taking in the word. So when we take in the word, uh, it's powerful. It can even transform a person. You know, somebody who is given to the word over a period of time, let's say, you know, uh, or we ourselves, when we observe our journey and notice the changes, we are amazed by what has happened uh, uh, That because we have been yielding ourselves to the word of God. So that is the power of God's word. God's word is able to transform us. God's word is really powerful uh, that it also reveals the person of God to us. Uh, there, there's a place where uh, Jesus rebukes, you know, learners of, of uh, scripture in John chapter 5, where he says that you search the scriptures uh, and uh, you think in this you have eternal life, but you know, these scriptures testify of me. So here's the other powerful thing about the word of God. The word of God helps us know God. Uh, it reveals God to us. So that's, again, you know, the beauty of, of uh, studying the Bible. So whenever we read the Bible, you know, we must do it with that passion of knowing God because Jesus said that these uh, scriptures testify of me. So we will find God. We will find Jesus. We will find the uh, attributes, the character of God in the scriptures. And that's the power of the scriptures. We also understand that the word is powerful. It it gives us faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in that sense, again, like if I want to build faith in my life, uh, let's say for healing or for uh, 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 blessing or anything like, you know, serving in the ministry for growing in uh, my walk with the Lord, any kind of faith that I want to build within myself will come from the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing uh, by the word of God. So 
that is again another powerful aspect of the word and there are many you know we can just keep listing and listing and listing but i am in a in a just i'm just sharing uh, the word of god is the sword of the spirit so in spiritual warfare the way uh, jesus he said it is written it is written he used the sword so it's powerful uh, and it helps us fight against the enemy and the works of the devil the word of god has the ability to cleanse us uh, jesus told his disciples he said you are already clean because of the word that i have spoken to you and again you know we read that jesus will wash the church with the water of the word so uh, as we listen to the word you know what's happening we are being cleansed all the dust all the unnecessary dirt of the world everything is just being removed off of us and that is again the work of the word so uh, you see the word of god is living uh, it's active it's powerful it's doing a work in us while we may just think that okay i'm listening to god's word i'm taking in god's word what can it do it's doing a lot it's doing a lot in us building faith cleaning us up and you know transforming us making the kind of making us the kind of people that god wants us to be provided we yield to the word and jesus also said in john uh, 15 he said that you know if you abide in me my words abide abide in you uh, then what is the result you will bear much fruit so blessing uh, if you want to term it as being fruitful or um, being uh, useful for god uh, or uh, uh, you know if, if if the word prosper doesn't offend us then we can use that term the word prospers us spiritually the word prospers us uh, in in every area of our lives and these are the blessings of the word of god you know uh, with the word we can uh, pull down uh, build up all that is there in jeremiah chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 again we can see the the creative power of god's word uh, at work so these are all some of the features of god's word that we can recognize when we say that his word is uh, powerful and what else do we read in this scripture we see here that uh he says sharper than any two edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart so the word of god is able to help us distinguish that's what it means distinguish between what distinguish between what is what is coming from the spirit what is coming from the soul okay so the word the more of the word of god we take it to ourselves it helps us divide the actual truth of god's word from you know other thoughts or worldly patterns worldly ideas and uh, that is the meaning so in in a in a certain way uh, you know you could say that it does that diagnosis analysis and diagnosis uh, of okay this is the condition of the heart uh, uh, it exposes the thoughts and intents of our hearts we may think that uh, what i'm thinking is right but as we engage with the word if those thoughts are fleshly then you know the word it's almost like uh, we're reading the bible and the bible is hitting a torch light at our hearts and saying you know this is not okay or that is not okay this is what god's word says and so you need to align yourself to uh, what god's heart is all about so the hidden things get exposed and sometimes that is the most uncomfortable thing for many of us because we know that if we start engaging with the word it will tell us the truth and sooner or later uh, you know we will have to face that conviction within ourselves and overcome those ungodly or unfruitful
Okay, uh, I got disconnected there for a moment. Uh, let's resume. We were talking about the power of God's word, and we said that uh, God's word is also able to expose our thoughts and intents. Now, coming to verse 13, it says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Um, Okay, so we had some aircrafts flying over us. We couldn't uh, speak louder than their noise. Okay, we will uh, try and understand what this particular verse is saying. So it simply says that nothing is hidden okay, before God. He is omniscient. That's another attribute of God. Uh, and uh, so absolutely everything is open. To him okay and it also says that we must give account to god uh, and that is something that uh, we are all aware of that there will be a time when we have to give an account for the lives that we have lived and uh, the things that we have done now moving ahead uh, we'll we'll talk more um but this the, the next section is about uh, the Lord Jesus and him being the high priest. So I want to request someone to read from verse 14 to verse 16. And I also want to encourage us, please don't get distracted. I know we've had uh, quite a few interruptions today, but uh, things are fine now. So let's uh, keep the focus. Verses 14 through 16. And if someone can read it, that will be great. Hebrew chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was, was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Avni. Uh, we have been repeatedly told about the qualities of Jesus and how he is greater than anything that the, the uh, believers have seen or experienced thus far. So the writer talked about how Jesus is deity. He talked about how uh, the Lord Jesus uh, has embraced humanity fully. And then in chapter 3, we saw how he uh, spoke of Jesus more highly than Moses. Now here, he is giving us an emphasis on the fact that the Lord Jesus is a great high priest, Okay, a great high priest. He has passed through the heavens uh, and he goes ahead and describes you know, qualities of the Lord Jesus. He's passed through the heavens, uh, Jesus, the son of God, and he also goes on to talk about the high priest who can sympathize with us. He can sympathize with us simply because he has experienced uh, the, the same things that we are going through now. Now, one of the, one of the important uh, things for us to recognize is that in his humanity, the Lord Jesus was not exempt from uh, the afflictions of the world, one of which is temptation. Now, Satan uh, comes with the methods of his workings that we have uh, talked about in earlier courses, his devices, his wiles. Uh, one major way in which he tries to afflict mankind is through temptation. And when one gives him to temptation, um, they fall into sin. But look at this. We are told that Jesus is someone who was at all points tempted. That is simply saying that uh, 
as a human being all the temptations uh, you know which were possible they came upon jesus now being tempted it in itself is not sin temptation can happen but yielding to temptation so we usually say that the first thought is not a sin because sometimes satan can plant that first thought in our minds but when we go along with it and think the second thought aligned to what satan is suggesting that's when we are sinning so temptation can come our way jesus was tempted as we are but notice what the scripture says yet without sin because even though satan presented many ideas to jesus uh, he uh, fought against the devil you know i'm sure he would have said you know it is written it is written the way he did it uh, in in the wilderness uh, when satan was putting thoughts in his mind so jesus was tempted in every way yet without sin how is it helpful for us it is helpful for us because the lord jesus who is the great high priest he is now our representative and so he is able to judge us based on the human experience Okay. Uh, he's he is not disconnected to the human experience since he's had that human experience he knows the challenges he knows the struggles and uh, that is why the writer is encouraging the believers and uh, in a, in a sense what he's trying to say is your discouragement is not a surprise for god god understands but don't let this challenge lead you into sin instead he says you come to god you approach god so in verse 16 he says let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need so we have now a sympathizing a sympathetic high priest who represents us very well and this must give us courage to enter god's presence you know in james there is uh, this scripture where uh, uh james writes he says when we lack wisdom let's ask god uh, he gives to all abundantly and he gives without reproach reproach is when uh, somebody gives us but they give us uh, with a sense of con condemning us where they say you know uh, you don't deserve this uh, i should actually not be giving you but uh, because i am so gracious i will give you look at what you have done so that is reproach where uh, one is put down but when we look at jesus our high priest one of the things that gives us great confidence is he sympathizes with our weaknesses you know that should be all the more an encouragement for us to not hide our faults to not hide our shortcomings to not hide you know those weaknesses those gaps where uh, but we come before him saying god i know you understand that this is how i feel these are the challenges these are the struggles and you know uh, receive the mercy and grace which god has to offer and uh, so beautifully you know we can talk about every word here uh, it says throne of grace throne of grace grace is unmerited favor where we don't really deserve that favor uh, however god is giving it to us so he has a throne of grace from which we can receive unmerited favor and you know mercy is like uh, forgiveness though we deserve punishment instead of punishment we are given mercy so we have a great god who is able to release mercy he is also able to give us grace in our time of need so when we go through discouragements the best thing to do is to run to god because we understand he sympathizes with our weaknesses uh he has a throne of grace he is able to give us mercy he is able to release grace in our time of need and uh, he's the writer is actually encouraging 
the believers to have the right approach and he is saying come boldly again it, it's it's like a lot of encouragement packed into a few words there boldly is without hesitation freely with a sense of assurance where we can lay aside all our anxiety like philippians 4 6 it says you know, don't be anxious about anything but in everything you know, uh, with uh, thanksgiving make your requests known to god so we can make our requests known to god and god is there to hear us god is there to answer our prayers so let's uh, pause for a bit is there anything you want to add or talk about uh i know we touched on so many things but yeah feel free Uh, Avni, did you want to say something? No, ma'am. Okay, okay, sure. I think I mistake. Okay, no problem. Ah, uh, yes, Christopher. Ah, uh, yes, thank you, Pastor. I wanted to just uh, try to understand how um, the word rest in these verses, um, and you know, uh, the encouragement to, you know, to. To seek the rest, and and you know, be part of the rest. Uh, how it relates to God's rest uh, on the seventh day, and also the the word or the word of God. How does that all relate to it together? I just wanted to understand that. Okay, so uh, Christopher, you're saying, how does the rest which is given here relate with God's rest of the seventh day? right yes yes and also how how i mean how does it relate to uh, you know uh, getting that rest or how, you know how does it relate to the, the word of god okay uh so uh, as far as i i'll answer your second question first as far as the word of god is concerned um it's it's an encouragement i don't think it's flowing in line with rest because as you can notice uh, even in one given chapter there are different themes so now we did hebrews chapter 4 we talked about rest initially then we talked about the word of god and then we uh, uh, just now we talked about jesus being the high priest so how does it relate and connect actually you may not there may not be an exact connection it it it's not flowing in that sense these are separate subjects that he is addressing just to encourage the believers okay so that that is uh, the answer to your second part of the question now talking about uh, rest and uh, how does this rest relate to god's rest see god rested not because he was tired but because he finished what he needed to do and when he rested on the seventh day he ceased from his work he ceased from his labor he ceased from his striving now that is related to our faith when we are living our life with faith we are ceasing from our striving in works okay so that is the great that that is the the uh, very direct interpretation of uh, the the rest that is being talked about now we have of course try to expand it rest in all uh, its fullness and see you know many other things that rest means rest you know uh, in terms of uh, receiving god's promises and uh, ceasing from the laws and all those things but here primarily god ceased from his works and so when we become believers we have salvation we cease from our labor which tries to earn god's favor that is the primary meaning of rest over here um, and, and i think you know um, both are the same right like ceasing from striving ceasing from works god ceased on the seventh day and when we are now in faith 
we also cease from our works to earn salvation. Uh, does that make sense, Christopher? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, but just, uh, just, just trying to understand the that uh, relationship of uh, sorry, relating uh, you know the word uh, the rest that um, that God uh, uh, you know did on the seventh day. Uh, just going through the verses again. Uh, the very next paragraph is talking about you know I mean as in verse number and uh, verse number eleven it says let let therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Um, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. And then the next one is saying the word of God is believing and powerful. So what you mentioned was that, that in a way they are related, are they are unrelated um, uh, subjects or topics. Um, I'm just thinking, is there some link between, between verse number 11 and verse number 10? Okay, so uh, verse number Verse number 11 and verse number 10. OK, so uh, see, uh, I just shared that it's about living a life of faith. OK, living a life of faith. So when we live a life of faith, we are able to experience rest in God. That, now, that may not necessarily mean that uh, we don't have anything to do down here on the earth, but whatever we are doing, we are doing it in faith. So it's it's uh, primarily to cease from our striving and to live this life in faith that is entering God's rest. And uh, when it comes to yeah, that, that would be the link, uh, Christopher, between verses 10 and 11. Uh, if you're looking for a for a link between verses 11 and 12, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think there's like a direct link there. But uh, the author may have spoken about the word of God because the word generates faith. Because in verse 11, he's talking about diligent Enter the rest or diligent faith is what he's talking about. And where can you get that faith? You can get it from the word. So an indirect link or a, a, a small connect there can be, you know, uh, uh, sort of pulled, pulled out of those verses. Is that OK? OK, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you and uh, thank you everyone. Uh, we will take a break for 10 minutes and we will continue from Hebrews 5 right after that. See you soon.